Welcome to the second session of today. Just for people who don't know me, my name is Sinead Leahy. I'm the Principal Science Advisor at the um, NZA GRC. And apologies, you're now going to hear yet another Irish accent. I'm not sure what's going on. I might need to get my red pen and scribble New Zealand and Ireland in red paint the way things are, the way things are going. Okay, so we're going to start off this session with a, with a panel, so you'll be familiar with how this runs from, from yesterday. We've got four really experienced speakers joining us to today. Each of them will give a very short presentation, um, and then at the end of each of their four presentations, we'll then take some questions, both from the app, and I'll also, although I don't have my glasses with me, I will look out into the audience, because I know from talking to a few people at dinner last night, some people haven't even downloaded the event app, so uh, we want to give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions um, as well. So let's, uh, let's, let's get started. So firstly, I'd like to wel welcome uh, our first presenter, Nikki um, Hitslop. She's a farm owner and agribusiness. Nikki and her family farm an intensive sheep, beef, and arable ir irrigated property on the outskirts of, of Term. Uh, Timaru. Um, she's a very experienced um, farm advisor um, and it's wonderful that we have Nikki here to, today to give us a few of her thoughts around farming experiences and what that means in terms of agricultural GHG. So let's welcome Nikki to the stage. Morena. So you've now had your cup of coffee, and um, I'm really hoping that this session is about really giving you a sense of, so what does emission reductions look like at, at ground zero? Um, it's, you know, it is a pleasure to be here to, uh, talking to you as a sheep and beef farmer, um, and our challenges as farmers and as a sector about reducing emissions. Um, while I, while my husband and I, uh, farming an intensive um, irrigated finishing property in South Canterbury. I actually grew up on an extensive high country station um, in the back of Fairley and, and spent a number of years as an advisor. So um, I, I feel I do have some understanding of quite a wide range of, um, of our sector. But I, I certainly don't have all the answers in terms of how we are going to reduce emissions. Next slide, does that? It's a green button. Oh, brilliant. There we go. Okay, so um, this is us. Um, 320 hectares, uh, predominantly irrigated, rolling downs. We finish lambs and beef. Uh, we graze dairy heifers, and we grow 30 to 40 hectares of crop, uh, mostly barley, but um, smaller areas of hybrid radish and, and carrots. So even over the last um, you know, 20 years, we, our farm has changed, and there's been discussions about, well, what does 2050 look like? And look, I'm really confident that our farm will be doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Um, we certainly have options, as do most intensive land users in New Zealand, but even more so because we have water. And I would, you know, I'd really like to highlight that that's super important going forward, that we have security of water. Our options, however, are different um, to the North Island, given our cooler climate in the south, and our rolling hills topography. Um, and even more so when you, when you go back to where most of our sheep and beef farmers are in hill and high country. But certainly integrating stock and crop will continue to be a really important part of managing our soils. And for us, you know, if we've got healthy soils, then water quality becomes, um, you know, then, then we at least maintain or improve our water quality. Biodiversity is important and we are protecting soil carbon. So we don't, we certainly want to be careful that we don't change land uses, um, reduce our emissions, but erode our soil carbon. So all of these things we need to take into account. In a broader sense, I guess I just wanted to share with you the challenge and the why. And, and Simon Upton spoke this morning about the importance of the why, and that is a massive challenge for us as farmers. Everybody in this room, I think, gets it. But we are still spending a lot of time on the why with our farmers. And until we get a deeper understanding of that, then it's, it's hard to move forward quickly. 
So sheep and beef farms represent 45% of uh, total farmed area in New Zealand. We are the home of 25% of our native woody vegetation. We produce uh, naturally raised lamb and beef with some of the lowest carbon footprint in the world. That, does not, that is not a get out of uh, jail card. Our family farming businesses are brand advocates for New Zealand um, with stunning landscapes and typically have a light environmental, environmental impact. We are committed to kaitiaki tangi. And I would actually argue we always have been, but um, more information, more education means that what we did yesterday, we won't be doing tomorrow. The sheep and beef sector, and I often hear this from our farmers, the sheep and beef sector have reduced our sector emissions by 30% since 1990. True. Um, however, that has been predominantly through land use change to more intensive land uses. So again, that does not let us off the hook. We have a long history of innovation and adaptation. The policies of the late 80s and 90s sent some really strong messages to our sector of get more business savvy, develop, lift production, be profitable or get out. And there was significant amounts of carnage of those policies of, of the late 80s. And what I would ask is that we really make sure that our transition through this challenge we have in, ahead of us, um, we manage better. Sheep and beef farmers are feeling threatened by not only emission pricing, but also a raft of policy and regulation which could obviously have significant impacts on viability. And that is undoubtedly causing a big risk of disengagement. And in fact, I think, you know, we have a number of farmers um, that are disengaged. So again, that is a challenge, let alone moving um, and supporting our farmers from the destruction of, of the last um, month. You know, we do have our farming sector, like all, has ready access to the internet of things and a wide range of conflicting information, which creates confusion. Every time I talk to farmers um, about some of the information that has been um, presented over the last couple of days, at the end of that, I have somebody undoubtedly come up to me and give me a heap of information why all of this is not true. So um, that is something we need to navigate. Climate change unequivocally affects us as farmers more than most. And, and yes, we've seen the devastation of Gabriel, but even within our more normal seasons, it is the driver of a good or bad year. We can have wonderful product prices, but um, sometimes Mother Nature just does not allow us to benefit from that. Certainly we've heard over the last couple of days that our consumers are inquiring about how we farm, our impact on our environment and our emission reduction commitments. That is, um, that's a real opportunity, I think, for the market to send strong signals. Farmers will often respond a whole lot better from market signals than regulatory signals, which um, is, uh, is not rocket science. So um, doing nothing is not an option. Um, but we do ask that additional warming impact be considered. And, and I know Simon Upton talked about this additional warming this morning, and people have different understandings of what additional warming um, is. And, and Simon put up some wonderful information that additional warming does not mean that we just hold our emissions. It means we do face the challenge of reducing our emissions um, over, over time. So the problem or barrier to doing something Again, previous speakers have spoken about easy. We just reduce stocking numbers. Um, but we know this would really decimate our farms and our communities, particularly our sheep and beef communities, which traditionally, actually, in a hill and high country, um, have relatively low stocking rates already. In our sector, in many districts, due to climate and topography, we are approaching um, our biological threshold of increasing productive efficiency. So sure, um, we often hear, look, just drop your stock numbers and increase your per head performance. It's not that easy in hill and high country because we are pressing up against a biological system. Again, that does not mean we should not do something. Financially, our sector um, are really sensitive to, um, to climate swings in product prices, inflation and so forth. Um, so again, that makes us really cautious and, and perhaps conservative by, by history and by need. 
Sequestration. Um, you know, I think we've spoken about it would be really advantageous if we could more accurately identify and measure on-farm sequestration. So I think I'm, you know, I'm uh, perhaps um, uh, glass half full in this regard. I think there will be tools that will allow us to do that going forward, um, and that will again um, uh, put to bed a lot of the conjecture around um, sequestration. But we do know that soil carbon sequestration is perhaps unlikely um, to be a tool that we can really rely on to make significant um, uh, increases in New Zealand just because of our recent soils, but I do know that there is more work being done in that area. Mitigation, in our sector we see limited near-term options to mitigate methane, and hence why it is just so important that we invest in R&D. Um, and we need to, so we do need to accelerate that, and wasn't that graph fantastic in terms of the additional spend. Solutions, um, integration of trees on farm, I know there's been so much backlash against that, but absolutely, um, like in fact Simon Upton mentioned, I see a huge opportunity for integration of trees. That is about being able to identify poor hill country and being able to um, plant that with the right trees in the right place. Um, R&D I've spoken about, just so important. We do have low methane sheep genetics, um, but not at scale yet, and that will take some time for us to be able to do that. Um, and there are a number of things there that would make a huge difference. Methane inhibitor in a bolus, uh, methane vaccine, absolutely. Land use change will be an option, but again, in our hill and high country, that is limited, and we need to be thinking about that. Uh, increasing animal performance, again, an option, but if we do that, if we finish animals more quickly, if we just replace that feed that would otherwise um, have been fed to those animals um, and feed it to other animals, we've achieved nothing. So it's not a, a simple solution. Uh, sequestration friend or foe, it, it's not really a binary thing. Um, it, it, it is an opportunity for some of our, our sheep and beef farmers, and these figures here have um, been shared by um, Phil Juno. Um, so look, if we have the opportunity to plant 1% of our farms in, in pine trees, um, you know, there is an opportunity there in terms of cash flow, um, let alone the fact that we are offsetting. But I just, you know, we, we need to be careful with that. It is only a 16-year window. Um, it, it, it's not the answer in itself. Um, where we do have areas in New Zealand that planting trees is, is just not an easy solution. The Mackenzie Country, for instance, um, district council rules um, limit the amount of trees being sown. Central Otago, Otago, you can plant them, but they don't grow well. So there are other things that we need to look to. And again, these um, figures by Ag First um, highlight some options that certainly we need to be thinking about as sheep and beef farmers. So just to highlight here, um, our farm, you know, previously our emissions have been about eight and a half um, tonne of carbon uh, per hectare. Uh, we are dropping 150 head of cattle out of our system and increasing our arable and planting a small area in trees. That will have a methane reduction of about 24%. So we can do it, but it is considerably harder for our extensive sheep and beef. So this is the property where I grew up, um, and, I, and I guess my question is, you know, on this beautiful red tussock land, do we really want to see pines as our only option. So, and I'm being a little bit provocative when I say that, um, it is the importance of why we need to invest in R&D to give us some more options. So key messages, um, agriculture is absolutely facing the biggest challenges and changes since the 1980s. Transition is critical. There will be threats and opportunities. Um, threats, if we do nothing, we face increasing emission pricing and we erode our social licence and product brands. Whole farm carbon farming is not the answer, but integration of trees on farm can be. Um, 
and, and too much stick through regulation, and I'm probably not just talking about regulation in terms of climate change, um, will disempower farmers. And so we need to be really careful about that. But let's finish with the opportunities. It is absolutely about investing in R&D, and that is a priority for Hawaka. Um, that develops and provides mitigation that can be widely adopted to have material impact. And I guess, as a sheep and beef farmer, you know, even if those near-term mitigations are more dairy-intensive farm-centric, it will have advantages um, for us all if emission reductions are shared across the sector. And that is something that I spend quite a bit of time talking about with my um, sheep and beef farmers. Um, we need to be careful of that 16-year carbon cash flow uh, windfall for sheep and beef farmers. And I guess that 16-year does does refer to, to pine trees, um, obviously, if they're if, and productive uh, pine trees as opposed to permanent plantings. We need more consideration of policy carrots than incentivise emission reductions. Um, and ultimately, and this is my Pollyanna view, um, New Zealand farmers can be seen as the hero, not the villain in this debate if we work together. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki.